Konisti, how are you? Welcome back to the Candle of Tales podcast, where we tell stories from Irish mythology and chat about them afterwards. My name is Aaron, and I'm one part of the sibling storytelling duo that makes up Candle of Tales. And this spring, we've been delving into the story of the High King, the story of Cormac MacArt. And if you've not caught up with the series so far, you might want to go back to episode one, Art and Octon. And this episode will deal with how Cormac became king, and more importantly, how he met the beautiful Etlin. Now, if you want to support this podcast, you can be like our Patreon supporters who've gone over to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales and offered a small donation. And they also get to join us on a monthly Zoom call and chat to us and get to know us. So you can do that or you can just go to our website, candlelittales.ie and give a one-time donation on the PayPal button. Or you want to just find out about live shows, workshops that we could do, well, we have them on our website as well. But if you want to just listen to the story, listen away. <laughs> hey, Sorica, tell us the story, will you? It was a hard year when nothing grew. No crops. No acorns on the oak trees. All of the people, all of the animals in Ireland, going about, gaunt and hollow-eyed, starving. There was talk of the wolves coming down from the mountains. People were fearful, and people were hungry. And although Cormac didn't see wolves the way most people saw wolves, he could feel as well as anyone else when things were out of balance. He did not want to fight Lugud MacCon. He did not want war. It seemed to Cormac that starting a war to restore balance would be like digging the foundations out of a house to level its walls. An invitation to more chaos and worse. A change for change's sake. But neither did he want to do nothing. To wait passively for someone to bring him and place him on a throne. And so he followed his mother's path. Near Tara he had noted a pair of hawthorn trees growing like a gate with no hedge beside them, nothing visibly different on either side. And so Cormac went there, quietly, secretly, with none of his foster father's followers to protect him. He traveled alone, often at night. And when he got there, He stepped through, carefully and gently, as if even the grass under his feet could be bruised. Nothing changed but the way he saw it. Now as he looked around him, he could see life in everything. The grass that was growing, the trees, the birds. A magpie gave its harsh cry. A bird of the other world. And he followed his feet in deep silence. Cormac came to a clearing and he saw the woman there. Half of her was lovely 
and half of her was blood-soaked. She reached out her unstained hand towards him and said, You, you are the man who would be king. Cormac nodded. And you are Maeve Latharag, he said. Every king had to marry Maeve Latharag. Cormac's father had married her. Cormac's grandfather had married her. Perhaps at one time Lugad McCon had married her. But she had turned her face away from him. And now in the clearing in the other world she looked at Cormac and Cormac looked at her. And he said, I don't want to fight. I don't want to spill more blood. She said, sometimes a king has to. Then I will if I have to, he said. But not before. Can I win you with justice? Can I win you another way? She looked at him when he mentioned justice. Tell me more, she said. And so he did. He felt that voice bubbling up inside him the way it had at the King's Hall when he'd cried out that a shearing for a shearing was more just. He found himself talking for what felt like a long time about balance, about restoring things, about a ruling that was fair. Not something that punished the wrongdoer, but something that brought them back. Something that made them whole as well as the person they'd harmed. Something that wasn't about vindictiveness and malice and violence. Something that was truer than that. Something that allowed people to stay together, to live together. As he spoke, he could see in his mind's eye the hall at Tara. Behind it, something else. Something that was less seen that it was felt. The warm fur of the wolves. The closeness of a pack stays together for survival that hunts to help that cares for their weakness and does not serve only strength he saw the goddess listen and he noticed a change in her and when the words dried up in his mouth, she looked back to him and said, I'll give you my hand, my white hand, and you will be king at Tara. But no king alone can rule. Each king at Tara must have another half. You must marry me, yes, marry the land, pledge yourself to me. But you need a mortal wife. You need a woman who is your equal, who will sit by you. When Cormac came back through the gate, through the pair of hawthorn trees. Fiachna Kassan was there, waiting for him, with all of his followers gathered. And when they came to Tara, 
more and more people gathered. As if each of them from all corners of the land had heard a call and stood up and come. So that when Cormac entered, he entered in the midst of a great crowd. And it was the people who put Cormac on his throne and pushed Lugad Macon away. And so Cormac was crowned the High King of Ireland. But he was alone. He could feel the promise that he had made to Maeve Lathdarug, like a weight around his neck, pulling him down, distracting him. Now all those around him, all of his supporters, seemed to agree with the goddess that he needed to marry, and he needed to marry with some urgency. But to marry for the sake of it, to marry a woman just because he needed a woman, seemed so wrong to Cormac. He could not marry just anyone. He had to find a queen. He had to find his queen. A woman, his equal. A ruler like him. One day, when Cormac was out walking, to get away for a time from the pressures of kingship, from the mounting pressure to be introduced to every girl in Ireland. He came across a strange sight. There was a little house built at the bend of the river. Small, not very grand. And he saw a woman come out. And he saw her gathering rushes. And then she did a peculiar thing. She took all the rushes that she'd gathered and she divided them into two different piles. A larger pile of rushes and then a smaller pile where she'd selected carefully only the softest, only the most pliable, only the best and put them aside. He saw her call the cattle for their milking. And he saw how the first milk from each cow went into one pail that she put aside and all the rest of the milk into another. And then he saw her go to the river and draw water. Again, she had two buckets. One, she gathered, as most people Cormac could see and gather water, from near the bank, where it was easy to dip and get. Then he saw her gather up her skirts and wade out into the swift current where the water was coldest and cleanest and fill another pail there. The cleanest water, the softest rushes, the best milk, all set aside. Now he'd been watching her a while and so he felt awkward at approaching but she'd been so absorbed in her work she had not noticed he asked her who is it that you do this work for and she answered one who's worthy of it Cormac heard something in her voice something of sorrow and something of anger He didn't want to press her, so he asked if he could come back another day and call on her when she was not so busy. She gave her agreement, and they made their arrangement. When next they met, she told him her story. Her name was Ethna, and she was the daughter of the King of Leinster, Cahar Mor. Cormac knew the name, Cormac had met the man. But she was not living with her father, she was living with her foster father, Buichid. A man of fabulous wealth. Once. 
Gwichid had had great wealth and even greater generosity. Anethna told Cormac that it wasn't long when she was staying with her foster father that her own brothers noticed Gwichid's generosity and started to take advantage. They would invite themselves for feasts and outstay their welcome. They would compliment him on a fine cloak and Buichid, without thinking, would give the cloak to them. Little by little they chipped away at his great wealth until he was so reduced. He had only a small herd of cattle, only enough to support her and her foster mother and himself. And so at his wife's urging, Buichid and his little family had fled to Meath and set up in this little home where Ethna, the daughter of the king, worked as hard as she could to make up for her brothers. It struck Cormac how great her effort. It struck him somewhere, somewhere deep. It was not worth the same as great herds of cattle and vast wealth. This daily extra care and effort. And yet it was. It was just. It balanced. He could see how her instinct was like his. To see the wound and heal it. But he could also see that she was not a high king. She couldn't make a judgment against her own brothers. She couldn't force them to return what they'd taken. She couldn't restore her foster father to his place. She could only make his life easier, better, gentler in a thousand small ways. And she was. He asked her for her hand in marriage. Now, Ethna had liked this solemn, intelligent man when she'd met him. She was a little taken aback at the offer of marriage so soon. She was further taken aback still when she found out who he was. The High King of all Ireland. He did not present himself in such a grandiose way she liked him. She even liked how unassuming he was after the grandiosity of her brothers in Leinster, throwing their wealth around, always looking for more. But she told him there would be a problem. Her father, Carr Moore, would have to be consulted because Buichid, her foster father, could not give permission for her to marry. And then she and Cormac put their heads together and made a plan. Cormac kidnapped Ethna and for the insult paid a fine to Buichid. A fine equal to all the wealth that Ethna's brothers had made him give away. A fine that restored him to his high place. A fine that would ensure that he would live in wealth and prosperity until the end of his days. And now Cormac and his queen reigned at Tara. 